This is my favorite show. My Aww. favorite interview, dude. Thank you. Yeah. There's like a compilation of you getting compliments, by the way. If you ever need an ego boost, it's on YouTube. <laughs> well, some, you know what? And sometimes I do. And sometimes I do. So I know that you guys uh, have a love for sports that goes far beyond just sitting courtside at the Staples Center. Nick, I'm curious, when you spent a week in spring training with the Dodgers back in 2010, is there a story that stands out? Yeah, they didn't want him. <laughs> he didn't make the team. Um, yeah, that was amazing. So funny, not a lot of people know that uh, I did that. He's um, so excited that you just asked that question. I was so excited. <laughs> I can see he just I'm lit just, up. His hangover's just... gone. So as we mentioned in your intro, you have a Netflix special that's streaming now. But yeah, I'm man. curious, when you first moved from Nebraska to California to chase that dream, mm -hmm. what level of success seemed realistic to you? Like, what would be your minimum accomplishment for you to feel like, oh, wow, I made it? That's cool. I, I don't know if I've ever answered that question. I, I feel like I had, like, delusions of grandeur. I'm like, if I'm not at a Will Smith level of fame in three years, I'll husk corn for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I just started to chip away at it, and I realized like you can just sort of mini climb your way up. Uh, then I was like, oh, if I could just like do comedy clubs and be a headliner and like be a guy that is the the guy for the weekend, I would probably be happy with that. So I know that your journey to Comedy Central it wasn't easy and that you went through multiple iterations before Workaholics took on its form, but can you tell the people about the instruments of destruction? Oh my God. <laughs> what? Sean, where'd you even find that info? Dang, deep cuts. Um, the instruments of destruction was me and Blake's sketch group prior to um, Mail order. Mail order comedy and workaholics, and we just had the most bizarre sketches imaginable. It's a big transition for a kid, say, from New York to go to a small liberal arts college in the Midwest, but I imagine the culture shock must have been very intense showing up in rural Iowa to go to Grinnell, fresh off the plane from Karachi and Pakistan. What was the best thing about living in Iowa, and then what was the worst thing about living in Iowa? Oh, wow, good question. The best thing about living in Iowa was I'd come from like a very, very intense, like I came from Karachi, which is like, you know, like New York is 20 million people. Uh, you know, there weren't many Pakistani Indian people where I was, so I still felt like, I just felt a little bit special. So the best part of it was that it wasn't really populated. The worst part was that it wasn't really populated. By year three, you're like, all right, I need, <laughs> I need to go somewhere else. Loved Iowa, it was great, but at the end of the four years, very, very, very ready to move to a big city. What is the one question that you get asked most often that you hate answering? You're welcome. Good luck and Godspeed. Um, it's got to be, what does Babish mean? Because uh, I have answered it a billion times and We'll answer, it, we'll answer it here, hopefully for- I'll do it. I'll do it for you. You hate answering it. You know what? You know where He's Babish an, is from? A niche character from the West Wing. You're absolutely right. How many episodes of the West Wing? Three. Eight. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> when you knock someone out, is it just a pure thrill of victory feeling or is there a part of you that's like concerned for the other person? Uh, that's a great question because in my training, the concern lives in sparring. When you hit someone really hard in sparring, you're concerned for them, you know, because they're concerned for you. They're letting you know when they hit you that I got you, keep your arm up, keep your ribs covered or whatever. But when you're in a fight situation, and I did not know this, I've never been a professional fighter until that moment, there is no concern for each other. He came out to take my head off and uh, he failed. I was 43 at the time, like this guy was way younger than me. He was gonna beat me, but I wasn't having that. So. There's no room for concern is a short answer. You just have to go in there and it's like man against man, you know? So in a 2010 New York Times profile, you talked about being fascinated by the career of somebody like Daniel Day-Lewis, who's able to have this viable, huge career in acting while simultaneously maintaining a private life. Uh -huh. And since that time, we've gotten further away from that version of a movie star. Do you have any thoughts on how celebrity is handled in the media? Like, do you still yearn for that sense of privacy? That's a great question because, you know, my career spans over a couple of decades. I, I was talking to my publicist about this, you know, how the trends have changed. You get, you know, we want to know more. We want to know more. We want to do, we don't just want to do an interview. We want to eat hot eat wings, wings with yeah. you. You know, we want to, <laughs> and uh, that is a sign of the times. My personality in real life is probably way more disappointing than my characters that I get to play. I play way more interesting characters than who I am in real life. However, that said, 
I don't miss the days where you could be mysterious. I don't actually miss that. I watched Gordon Ramsay, I watched Shaq, and those guys were sweating bullets and cussing and raising all kinds of hell. So for me to be able to wing this, no pun intended, have a wonderful sit down conversation with you, who obviously does a shitload of research, was one of the defining moments of my entire life. Wow, well I am humbled, beer me, Chris. So as we talked about in your intro, you have a pair of movies this fall, Honey Boy and Peanut Butter Falcon, both of which have considerably strong reviews with some critics calling your performances career defining. Do you see it that way or are these just like the next projects to you? You're so great at this, dog. You're really good at this, bro. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Yeah. Um, uh, I forgot what the question was. I was enamored with you. <laughs> what did you just ask me? Do you see these as career defining films? Or are these the like the next this? projects to you? Do you do this in the mirror before we go? It doesn't look like I'm acting. <laughs> yeah. No, it just seems so prepared. Um, a defining. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I um, maybe. Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So as someone who's scaled the heights of entertainment and also founded their own venture capital firm, I think you're uniquely qualified to weigh in on this. Where are pitch meetings more likely to be parodies of themselves, in Hollywood or in Silicon Valley? Oh, that's a great question. I think Silicon Valley. They talk about this, the elevator pitch. Yeah. You'll literally get in an elevator and someone's like, I just gotta tell you about my company. I just gotta tell you about my company. Let me just tell you about my company. I have to tell you about my company. And you're like, dude, I'm gonna get off of this thing in like one minute. So you got a minute and you've already wasted 20 seconds saying, let me tell you about my, about my company. You better start telling me about the company. And it's usually like some guy with like a hoodie and it, I mean, it's, it's it, the it, tech bro. It, it's the archetype that you expect. And by the way, like one of the best interview questions I've had in a long time. Okay. Yeah? It's really lovely. I feel like- Well, I'm... we still have some time to go, you know, I can blow it here. Okay. <laughs> feel free. <laughs> in my humble opinion, the red carpet interview, it's the most daunting assignment in all of media. There's no way to prepare yourself for everything that gets thrown at you. The speed of it, it is so fast. And then the assignment is literally trying to get a usable soundbite from someone walking by you trying to get into the party. Mm -hmm. How would you detail the ups and downs of that experience at the Met Gala where all of those knobs are cranked up to 10? You are so well spoken. I enjoy conversation with you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You make me wish I went to more years of college so that I could be more um, You got that one spoken. under your belt. <laughs> Just that one. Where'd I go to school? Hold on, you went to school. You do your research, you say you do. I do, I do. So it was so in- So what is it, Sean? It was in Texas. Yeah. Come on, go for it. It's at the tip of your tongue. Just like this. Was it like Texas mind. State or something? No, University of Houston. University of Houston. Go Cougs! Cougars. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I get asked questions about hot ones, I always find myself delivering these parables over and over, which I find when I do it, perhaps, some of the nuance is lost. And you're somebody who's been doing press around TV and film for 25 years. Do you ever think about how much your narrative is shaped by the need to package the details of your life into these instantly accessible anecdotes? I, uh, a great question. I really, um, yeah, I, after a while you get used to answering the same questions, so you just kind of think of a different way to say the same answer. And at a certain point, I don't know whether or not that is the way it happened, if that's really true, or it's just I've answered that question so many times that it's now the truth or the way I feel about it. You've been upheld as a paragon of manhood in this day and age when the very tenets of masculinity are probably more hotly debated than ever. When people can survive perfectly well without knowing how to build a fire or fix a leaky faucet, what do you think is lost when people stop being handy? Well, nobody told me we were gonna go deep on this show. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, great question. I, um, first thing, I get accused a lot of being manly or masculine. And what I, I suppose some of that must be true, but I come by it honest. It's nothing, it's what, I, it's what I was born with. I look and sound like this. But I'm uh, actually a very talented ballet dancer. You'd be surprised to learn. I feel like everybody uh, across the spectrum of sexuality should know how to use a screwdriver or should be able to change a tire. You know, things break. And those of us who know how to fix things when they break just end up being better, responsible members of our community. So over the course of your career, I know that there are some dream gigs that got away. Which did you pursue harder, Baywatch or Lord of the Rings? Mm. 
You have a fine research department. I thought you had a great quote that was really interesting where you say, people have to try to understand that it's very weird for me to talk to people I don't know about something I care about so much. You're like a really well-researched and like great interview. This is wild. So are you. Thanks. So are you. Do you have any insight to why White Sox gear from the days of Easy e and Ice Cube to you and Kendrick Lamar, why it has such an esteemed place in hip hop? Uh, I don't know, that's a good observation. I would say it's probably the colorway, the black and white over, way over like ever feeling, you know, connected or accepted in baseball. I think it's more so a, like a rebranding of something that we find to be cool. Um, uh, why? Why? Um, why not? You're amazing at this, man. <laughs> you did a great job today, yo. Did you have a good time? Holy shit, dude. <laughs> I mean, no wonder this show's a hit. I mean, I legit was crying. Uh, it, it went just like I thought it would, except, uh, your questions were, were good, were better than I thought they would be. For a, for a chicken wing YouTube show? Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Right. You really never know.